Good evening to all of you. Welcome to our last class of uh, this session of Genesis. We've taken the first 11 chapters of Genesis, uh, and I've taken that block because we've been dealing with uh, the understanding that even people who uh, love the Word of God um, question the first 11 chapters for different reasons, whether or not it's actual history, did it really happen? We've been working from the premise that there's no reason to deny it. Hebrews chapter 11 refers to it as real history. The rest of scripture does as well. And we lose a lot. If, if we lose uh, these first 11 chapters, the idea of original sin, which we're going to talk about tonight, the doctrine of election, unconditional election, limited atonement. Tonight I want to uh, work, last time we, we worked from uh, the understanding, is there a sermon in there? How do we find the Christ in there? And here, how uh, the Old Testament is so important in terms of our doctrinal understanding. And so we're just going to go through a, a, a summary of, of the canons of Dort and show you how the first 11 chapters, but especially chapter 11, um, works itself out and how we can pull those doctrines uh, from there as well. And also, it might be a way, if you ever uh, are talking with someone who, who doesn't hold to the Reformed faith, um, to use this story of Genesis chapter 11, right, the... Um, mixing of the languages at Babel, and then how God moves the covenant line towards Abraham in terms of uh, the five points of Calvinism. So welcome to all of you. I have one uh, short text I want to uh, read with you uh, tonight, and that is at uh, Seth also had a son. He named him Enosh, and then at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And what we'll see in terms of the line of the covenant, the seed of the woman being preserved, taken care of, and used by Almighty God uh, in terms of our own salvation even today. Let me lead you in a word of prayer. Almighty God, we gather before your throne of grace as we turn one more time to the first book of the Bible as you've given it. Lord, you've shown many things about yourself, even given us insight into some of the conversation you had within the Trinity so long ago, whether it was to make man in your image, whether it was to punish humanity with the flood, or also, Father, when looking at wicked mankind, you decided to uh, change the languages. And yet, Lord, in all of it, we have seen your absolute faithfulness to the promises that you made to Adam and Eve and kept to us in our own baptisms and uh, throughout our lives. And it's good to read these things in light of the world that we live in today, where there's so much brokenness and, and so much distrust that we can sing again tonight. Great is your faithfulness, O God, our Father. And so, Lord, we pray a blessing on the teaching tonight. Uh, we pray that we may grow from it and that we may uh, understand how it is that we may live before your throne of grace and confess the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we'll go through then on uh, pages 28, 29, and 30, uh, class 10, Genesis 11 and the Canons of Dort. So, what is it that makes us reformed in terms of our, our confession, right? So sometimes when we're, we're reformed, we, we should probably be a little bit careful about that we're Christians. And we're Christians that are rooted in, in the scriptures, right? Um, and, and it is interesting that, that we would say we're reformed Christians as opposed to Arminian Christians or opposed to, say, Baptist or Pentecostal Christians. And yet it is helpful in the sense of we hold to doctrine. And doctrine that has been gleaned from Scripture. So we, we go from the New Testament and the Apostle Paul, especially, who is so helpful in all of that, but all the New Testament writers, and then uh, the church fathers, but especially Augustine, although there were some issues with Augustine, but generally speaking, he's very helpful. And then Martin Luther and uh, John Calvin, and then into our world today with men like Abram Kuyper and Herman Bovink, uh, R.C. Sproul. And men like that. And, and what does it mean that we're reformed? So it also means that we're a confessional church. And what we mean by that is we hold to the three forms of unity. So we confess something about Scripture. Uh, creeds, credo, I believe, and the confession is we are convinced and we are absolutely sure that these things are true. And so then when you call a minister or when we vote for office bearers especially, they sign the form of subscription and they also believe that these things are true. And the confessions kind of put a fence around the truth. So if I start preaching or an elder or a deacon starts teaching you things that are outside of these truths, you can say, hey, I don't think that's what the Word of God teaches. 
But tonight I want to show you that, that what we teach really does come from the Word of God. And, and the one, um, uh, you know, form of unity, the Canons of Dort, is not the one that we often deal with the most. And yet it is the, the five points of Calvinism which we talk about. So normally when we talk about the five points of Calvinism, when we teach it, we start with total depravity because that makes sense with how we've uh, experienced our salvation. I'm a sinner, and then the God comes to me. He chose me from before the foundation of the world. He sent Christ to die for our sins. I come to know that through the irresistible power of the Holy Spirit, and then he preserves us so that uh, we will be saved. So, tulip. But in the Canons of Dort, it's actually all tip. And uh, I write that there, that as Reformed churches, we have always sought to be confessionally rooted. Our confessions, in turn, must be biblically rooted. So the Canons of Dort were written by the Synod of Dort, 1618 and 19. And, and just interesting there that the Reformed men and ministers came from all over the world. And because there was different languages, they actually spoke in Latin to one another. It really, uh, you know, I know Richard Min can speak Latin, and I'm always amazed, but... It, these people were brilliant. And uh, people from Scotland, people from England, people from Belgium, people from the Netherlands, really from around Europe at that time came together and, and really worked hard. So it wasn't just the Dutch church. They invited others to come and say, what is it that we believe? Now they wrote that because there was issues fairly quickly. So if we remember that the Reformation is right in, in uh, the uh, 1560s, then 1618, right, it's in one generation you already have difficulty and problem in the church. And there was a man named Jacob Arminius, who though he said he signed the form of subscription and believed the things of the truth, began to teach, in part because he saw so much wickedness and decadence in the Dutch churches, that there must be something wrong with the, with the, the teaching. So if we teach that salvation is only by grace alone, it's not because of a choice you make, you're teaching people to be wicked and indifferent. And so he said that God chose us uh, on the basis of what we have done because he sees into the future, right? And we'll go through um, his five points, and then the synod answered those five points. So uh, Jacob Arminius died. His, actually, his name was Harmus, but they would Latinize the names. So, but Jacob Arminius died, and then his followers became what's called the Remonstrants, and uh, then the Synod of Dort met. The remonstrants were so rowdy and so difficult at the Synod of Dort, they actually had to be removed. And sometimes the Arminians say that was unfair, but uh, they were given plenty of time to speak. And then um, the, the Synod of Dort, those who were delegated to it from, as we said, all over the European and, and British uh, Isles, uh, declared Arminianism unbiblical and heretical. And so the canons, so canons doesn't mean big guns in this place, but it means uh, straight doctrine, the straight teaching of uh, the word of the Lord. So the idea of a canon, when I teach it in catechism, is if you have a ruler, you can draw a straight line. You can change the color of the paper, right? White, red, blue, doesn't matter, but you can always draw a straight line. And the idea is no matter where we are, if we're in Africa, we're in Toronto, uh, we're in the Netherlands, uh, we're in the 1500s, 1600s, or 20, uh, the 2000s, um, you can always draw a straight line because this is what the word of the Lord teaches. So again, it means we as Reformed people, we as Christians, people who believe in the Bible, believe in objective truth. We believe that there is truth. It's undeniable truth. It's God-revealed truth. And it's indisputable. Now that makes us very um, un favorable in this world, and especially for our kids going to universities. This, this makes it very difficult for them if, if they have to work on the basis that there are objective truths when, we're told, when they're told that there's not. That makes it difficult for them. And um, not only then do we need to teach our children about these truths, but we need to teach them why they're important and to hold on to them. So my question tonight is, does a reading of Genesis 11 demonstrate to us the truth of the canons of Dort? And obviously, that begs the question. Otherwise, we wouldn't be spending tonight on it. I think yes. So the first head of doctrine, unconditional election and reprobation. So we teach predestination. Pre means before, obviously, 
and destination. That means where you are going to end up has been decided before you exist. Now that's quite something, right? And, and by the way, this is the big knock against Calvinism in the bigger Christian world. That they're saying it basically takes away free will, and we will deal with that when we get to um, total depravity. But it, it, they think it makes God then arbitrary. Uh, it, it doesn't make God very loving. Why does God choose to save some and not save others? Uh, however, we want to understand God as he reveals himself. Let God be God. So Ephesians chapter 1, from before the foundation of the world, God decided, God elected us, God chose us in Jesus Christ. So the word elect in the scripture is never used of anyone else but God. We never read that human beings elect, choose God. It's always the other way around. So now the question would be on what basis does the Lord God choose us? So the fact that some receive from God the gift of faith within time, so that, that means it's, it's not, the elect at some point will know that they're elect. God, God doesn't let you die and say, oh, by the way, you were elect when you get to heaven. He's going to let you know in this life before he calls you home, all right? So the fact that some receive from God the gift of faith within time and that others do not stems from his eternal decision. Article 6 of the first head of doctrine. God chooses to save some and pass others by with his grace in his good pleasure based upon nothing in mankind or humanity himself. So Arminianism taught God chooses those God chooses those who would choose him because he sees into the future and knows who will choose him. Therefore, election is based on God looking and seeing how you and I will respond to him. Canons of Dort 1.8, this election is not of many kinds. It is, not, it is one in the same election for all who were to be saved in the Old and the New Testament. So the understanding was perhaps Abraham got saved in one way, And then when the nation of Israel got the law, the Ten Commandments, right, they got saved another way. And then when Jesus Christ came and Pentecost came, they got saved another way. And in dispensationalism today, some would still teach that Israel is still being saved on the basis of the Old Covenant, and the church is being saved, Gentiles are being saved on the basis of the New Covenant. But Romans chapter 11 makes it clear that all have been saved the same way. So even Romans chapter 3, all have fallen short of the glory of God, the Jew and the Gentile, and all are saved by faith alone, as Abraham was saved, Romans chapter 4, that's how we are saved, all right? So scripture declares that there is a single good pleasure, purpose and plan of God's will by which he chose us from eternity, both to grace and to glory, both to salvation and to the way of salvation, which he prepared in advance for us to walk in. So I have to talk just a a bit about reprobation because there's some discussion about reprobation. There's two ways to understand reprobation. One is that uh, God passes over man with the operation of his Holy Spirit. Others believe in the the Reformed world, no, God hardens hearts. So we read in in Romans uh, chapter 9, for instance, Uh, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. But then it goes on to talk about, it's not after him who wills. And then then, uh, Paul talks about God's decision to harden the heart of Pharaoh. I think probably it's it's both. But the reality is, um, the Canons of Dort talks about God passing us by. So all of us deserve to go to hell. All of us are born children of wrath. All of us are born apart from God. And unless he moves by making us born again by the Holy Spirit, we would never choose him. So God chooses from before the foundation of the world to save, or sorry, to create you and then to recreate you by the operation of the Holy Spirit. So if you want, we're all in a big orphanage. The orphanage belongs to Satan, so to speak, but God decides he chooses this child, this child, and this child, gives them the Holy Spirit, writes the new papers in the blood of Jesus Christ, their mind, their mind, your mind, your mind, you come in and there's nothing Satan can do about it. But God has the right to and does leave other people in that orphanage. And that's why we talk about double predestination. He's chosen to uh, save some, 
and he has let others to continue in their life. And, and, and I'll, uh, without getting redundant, I'll, I'll move on just a bit from that. And I hope um, you'll understand human uh, responsibility in all of this. So when we go back to um, Genesis, before the fall, right, we read that man was wicked in his heart, wicked in his imagination, inventing ways to sin. Man is absolutely without any beauty or any majesty. God says, I relent or sorry, I repent um, that I've even made human beings. That's how bad it got. Um, but there's a man named Noah. And where does this Noah come from? Because we never read that Noah said, Hey God, why don't you save me and my wife and my boys? God came to Noah. Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. Noah, I am going to um, save you, but I need you to build an ark. So God has his man on the earth. And the Tower of Babel, I mean, within one generation, I mean, likely Noah is still alive when, when this whole mess happens here at Babel. And what is all mankind doing again? Standing opposed to Almighty God. And it would seem hopeless. Again, it's hard for us because when we read Genesis, many of you know these stories already because of faithful parents who told you the stories. But if you're Israel or if you're reading the Bible for the first time starting at Genesis, you're going, but I thought God was going to save a people and now people are really wicked again and now he's even confused their language. What's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is this is the account of Terah's family. Terah became the father of Abraham. And in the first verse of chapter 12 is the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country. God separated Terah. And then God comes to Abraham. And if he didn't, there would be no hope for us. So God had left most of fallen humanity to their own sin and judgment, but he works through the line of Shem to bring Abram to this earth and then in time call him. That is God's act activity and not Abram's. And if, if I can go all the way back to the fall into sin, we talked about that, right? Adam and Eve fell into sin, but they never asked for forgiveness. God came Adam what did you do? Eve, what did you do? Okay, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to make a promise and I'm going to bring salvation, but there's going to be some saved, some who are not saved. There's going to be children of light and children of darkness, and there's going to be enmity. And that, that seed of serpent is, is going to hate me. And we can understand the Tower of Babel because, like we said, we live in a world that's opposed to Almighty God even now. How come that is? Well, because God uses that also to help us understand the joy and the beauty of being the elect children of God. We are not like them, but for the grace of God. So why would we want to be like them? So the idea, even, even as we, we work through that whole theme in Genesis, is God keeps his promise to you who are saved from before the foundation of the world. He decided to save Mark, Dave, Homer, and Lyndon, Sonia, and Jason by keeping that promise and making sure that there's a Noah and there's an Abraham. And then ultimately we're going to see that that whole culmination in Jesus Christ, aren't we? He is the chosen one. In him we are chosen. In him we have life. But um, it really is a remarkable thing. One more thing. If the promises were based on Abraham... so. The health and wealth and prosperity gospel actually teach this, that when Adam and Eve fell into sin and the world fell into the flood, if God hadn't had a Noah who called on him, or if Noah had said, no, God, I don't want to believe you, and then they say ultimately with Abraham, Abraham gave God a right to be back on the earth again, and then Abraham had faith, and look what happened. Noah got rich and Abraham got rich, so you can have faith too, and you can be rich too. You need to give God permission you think about the blasphemy of that and, and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are believing this and millions of dollars are, are being, in, and right now there's 10 pastors' hands and, and these men are multimillionaires. They're flying around in jets and it's horrible and it's wrong because the minute that something goes wrong in your life, well, it's because you don't have faith. So it's very important that we see the mighty act of God to choose a people and then to make a promise and keep the promise because he can do it and you and I cannot. 
Noah got drunk. He fell into sin. We're going to see that Abraham falls into sin. God had every right to say, I'm done with you. But God chooses to forgive them, and he chooses to forgive us. So again, we see that those stories are our stories, that history is our history. Now, one of the most difficult doctrines in, in um, the Christian world, and it's up for a debate, is what we call limited atonement. So literally, atonement has to do with the covering of your sin. So on the Ark of the Covenant, where those two angels, right in their wings, um, sat over the mercy seat, but a better translation actually is the atonement cover. And the atonement cover is the, is the covering of God whereby he doesn't see you in your sin. He sees you as forgiven, as if you had never sinned. All right? So sometimes we teach this. It's not the best, but it might be helpful. At one meant. Do you see how the word can break up that? At one meant. By the grace of God, he comes down and he makes us one ultimately by the mercy of the blood of Jesus Christ. So when Adam and Eve fell into sin, they were naked. What did God do? He killed an animal. Not just to clothe them, but to point to the blood of Jesus Christ. I cannot look at you unless something dies because ultimately someone is going to have to die for me to look at you. All right? Now, why do we say it's limited? Um, There's different words, and I'm not going to talk about all those words tonight, but I'm going to just stick with this one. We say it's limited in terms of the elect. Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of sins of the elect. It's not limited in terms of its power. If God decided that Jesus Christ died to save everyone, then that death is good enough. That that death is powerful enough. There's no sin that is within us that can't be scrubbed clean. It's limited in terms of who it's applied to. And that makes sense. If God chooses who's going to be saved, they are going to be saved. So when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, you can believe that you're saved. It's not on the basis of a choice you make. It's on a basis of the application of the blood of Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life by the, by the amazing grace of Almighty God. That's why to say amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, doesn't make sense if it's amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that I decided to get saved by choosing Christ. So when Christ died, and it would be easier if you could see that, but if you remember the sanctuary, there's an exit door right there, or a sign over the door, right? And that door is open. So what many Christians believe is that when Christ died, he opened that door, and now all of us have to decide to walk through that door, and then we get saved. Christ and God are not in the realm of possibilities. They're in the realm of reality. When Jesus Christ died, we are forgiven. We do have salvation. It's on the basis of his work alone. So Canons of Dort 2 verse 2.8. For it was the entirely free plan and very gracious will and intention of God the Father that the enlivening and saving effectiveness of his son's costly death should work itself out in all his chosen ones. So enlivening, you were dead, you he made alive, Ephesians chapter 2. It's not just that the blood washes you clean, it makes you alive. And then justifying faith. So what justifying faith means, I believe that Jesus died for me. It's not because I believe I'm saved. Faith says I know I'm saved because of what Jesus did for me. In order that he might grant justifying faith to them, the elect, the chosen one, and them only, and thereby lead them without fail to salvation. In other words, it was God's will that Christ, through the blood of the cross, by which he confirmed the new covenant, the Lord's Supper, baptism, which we're doing right now in our uh, sermons in the afternoon, should effectively redeem from every people, tribe, nation, and language all those and only those who were chosen from eternity to salvation and given to him by the Father that he should grant them faith. He gives the faith, which like the Holy Spirit's other saving gifts, he acquired for them by his death, that he should cleanse them by his blood from all their sins, both original and actual. So original sin has to do with, I know when we think of original sin, we think about Adam and Eve eating the fruit, and that's the first sin, and we could say it's original But when we talk about original sin here in the canons of the Lord, it means the sin you were born with. I was born as a child of wrath. I was born a child of death. 
and then you he made alive again, all right? So original and then the actual sins that we do or the things that we should do that we don't do. Whether committed before or after coming to faith, that he should faithfully preserve them to the very end and that he should finally present them to himself, a glorious people without spot or wrinkle. So Arminius taught that Jesus' death covers the whole world's sin but did not secure salvation. You have to do that yourself. Although Christ died for every man, in his language back then, every person, only those who believe in him can secure salvation. Man must choose to accept the grace of God. Now let's go back to Genesis 11. Is anybody calling on God? Even Abraham is not calling on God. Terah is not calling upon God. In the line of Shem, do we read about anyone who's calling on the name of the Lord? We see God preserving the line. We see God protecting the line. And then when we go to Revelation, uh, Revelation Romans chapter 4, but again in Hebrews chapter 11, it was by faith that righteousness is credited to Abraham. And God comes to Abraham, Romans chapter 4 says. And, and God says, and we pick that up in, in, in Revelation 12 when we get together again, then the Lord said to Abraham, get up and go. Abram didn't wake up one morning and said, this would be a good idea. Why don't I get up and go and then we'll start a whole new Israel. No, God said, Abraham. And, and the thing that you need to understand too, that, and, and we'll get that, but that irresistible call. When God calls you, that faith happens, okay? So it's the same thing when Jesus says, Lazarus, get up. A dead man heard Jesus and walked out of the grave. How, how could he obey? It's because Jesus, by that calling word, God, by that calling word, the Holy Spirit, by that calling word, at some point in your life, awoke you. Is that right? Woke you up, I should say better. Um, he made you alive. And you, oh, yeah, that's right. I, I believe this. And it's not of us, right? So when we, when we read that and we pull it together in Scripture, Jesus died for Adam and Eve, and he died for Abel. And Jesus died for Seth and Noah and Shem and Abraham and you. God didn't make salvation possible. He saved them. And he saved them by applying the blood of his son to these people's lives. And again, do you see how important that is in terms of your own salvation? You can be convinced you're saved. When Sonia and I lived um, in, uh, in um, Jarvis... The Jehovah Witnesses came quite often. And um, I remember a man <clears throat> came with his wife and they came with their little children. And I asked him, <clears throat> I said, what do you believe about salvation? And he gave me the basic Armenian position. I said, are you positive you're saved? Like if you die tonight, can you believe you're going to go to heaven? And he said, no, that would be arrogant. I, I might lose my faith. Uh, or, or actually, in their view, there's only 144,000 who are saved. He says, I might not even be one of the 144,000. I said, to me, that's an arrogant statement. Either God saved you or he didn't save you. And then we went through Scripture. Part of the problem with Jehovah's Witnesses, their Bible doesn't say the same thing as <clears throat> the proper Bible does. But the reality is, is, is that they have no hope. And that's what Martin Luther had. Martin Luther, which is the semi-Pelagian position, is... There's grace, and grace makes it possible to be saved. And now I, I need that possibility by earning it myself. The poor man went almost crazy, and he struggled with depression and eating disorder the whole rest of his life by trying to earn his salvation because he was actually serious about it. When I pray, I'm sinning while I pray. Now I've got to pray. When I'm asking forgiveness, I'm sinning while I'm asking forgiveness, so I have to ask for more forgiveness. You become absolutely useless to the Great Commission if you, don't, if you can't say, I am saved because of the work of Jesus Christ. I am saved because of the plan of Almighty God. How are we going to talk to other people? Well, are you saved? Well, I don't really know, but you should. No, let me tell you, brother, Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. And I know in whom I believe it, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto me against that day. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus died for us. I'm just going to stop there. Jason, any questions on the chat? Okay. And any questions in here? Okay. Then let's go to the third head of doctrine. Total depravity. Now, this is also very difficult. And this is where we deal with free will. 
So let's just take the discussion of free will for a minute. What do we say about that? We, first of all, need to be very careful because right, there's no free will. Well, did I have free will to marry Sonia? Did Homer have free will to marry Linda? Mark and Katrina? There's, there's movement in there, isn't there? We know that everything's happening according to the plan of God, but he also incorporates us, right? So there's free will. You, you decided to watch this tonight or you didn't. Or maybe you're going to watch it later. Um, the, which house to buy, right? There's this house and that house. And then, you know, we talk about God's sanctifying common sense. Free will, when we're talking about it, is in total depravity, when we're talking about it, has to do with a choice or something that you could do that would ensure your salvation. That, that Okay, choose now this day whom you will serve. Joshua says that, right? But he's speaking to the covenant people of God, and he's saying, you have to make a choice. But the whole rest of the Bible says when you make a choice, understand it's because God put the Holy Spirit in you. Now again, I keep talking about Ephesians chapter 2, but it's very important. You, us, then, then Paul actually says, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. You he made alive again. So the Arminian position would be this. We're on a boat and uh, we fall overboard and the winds are whipping up and we're in a storm and Jesus comes by in the USS Salvation and he throws a life preserver out to you. Now you have a choice. Are you going to grab that life preserver or not? Or you're dead on the couch or sorry, you're you're on the couch and and, uh, you're sick And as a sick person, you can say, there's the medicine of the word of the Lord. There's Jesus Christ. I can get up. I can pick up that medicine. I can take it and I'll make myself better. But that's not the language, is it? It says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And you he made alive again. There's nothing about us in that caption. There's nothing about us in that story. And look again. Did anybody in Genesis 1 through 11, did anybody make a choice for Jesus on their own? Did anybody make a choice for God on their own? No, he kept coming to them. Noah, Shem, Abel, Seth. This is the act of Almighty God. Adam, where are you? What did you do? Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. Take my life. Don't let my wife die. No, he didn't say that. It's that woman you gave me. And, and, If we don't really understand that, we'll never understand what grace really is. That we don't deserve it. There's nothing we could ever do. Isaiah 66, your righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Women's throwaway cloth, bloody and ugly. That's the best we do. And he still loves us. Why? Because he chooses to love us. So what does the Bible teach? We're out in that boat. I drown. I'm at the bottom of the ocean. And Jesus drives, dives in. And he pulls me up. And he gives me mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. He breathes the Holy Spirit in me. And I'm alive. And then what happens? You saved my life. I owe you my life. What can I do for you? We're dead on that couch. And he gives us mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. And he gets the heart going again through the power of the Holy Spirit. You saved my life. What can I do? for you. The problem with Arminianism is is it's a hanging on to pride. I want somehow, some way to say I did something. And then I guess God could say, or I could say to God, yeah, but I did this for you. And the Bible says, no, it's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So um, the the five points of the remonstrance are answered with three and four which is uh, total depravity and then the irresistible call. But we'll start with total depravity. Uh, three, four, verse, or Article 3 on the top of page 29. Therefore all people are conceived in sin and are born children of wrath. This is straight from Ephesians chapter 2. Unfit for any saving good. Inclined to evil. Remember the catechism says that? I'm so inclined that I hate God and I hate my neighbor. And even after we're saved, that inclination is still there. Dead in our sins, slave to sin, without the grace of the regenerating Holy Spirit, they are neither willing nor able to return to God. You know, 
if we really look at this in light of the God, then we, we are truly the true Pentecostals because we understand the power of the Holy Spirit in terms of, of, of that regenerating power. It hasn't, it's not about speaking in tongues, first of all, or, or, or miraculous gifts. It's about the resurrection of you, who you are, and now instead of serving Satan or yourself, you now serve Almighty God because you were unaware of him. You were dead to him. And he was dead to you, so to speak. So we are neither willing nor able to return to God to reform their distorted nature, nature or dispose themselves to such reformed. And, and, and you know, as, as much as Billy Graham did a lot of good things, on that he was desperately wrong because he kept asking people to do what they were incapable of doing. And that's why, too, this whole idea of the sinner's prayer or inviting Jesus into your life. Jesus doesn't need an invitation. Prayer is absolutely, you know, Lord God, forgive me, work in my heart. But the idea that God cannot, I, and you hear preachers say that, God wants to save you. Jesus wants to enter in your heart, but he can't unless you let him in. Really? Then who's God? No, we understand the power of God over against our inability. Article 10, the fact that others who are called through the ministry of the gospel do not come and are brought to conversion must not be credited to man. So, how is it possible that 10,000 people can hear the gospel and let's say 5,000 people are saved and 5,000 people are not saved? Is it because 5,000 people are brighter than the other 5,000 people? No, it's the act of Almighty God. He separates the wheat from the tares. So um, again, as though one distinguishes himself by free choice from others who are furnished with equal or sufficient grace or faith for conversion, as is the proud heresy of Pelagius maintains. No, it must be credited to God, just as from eternity he chose his own in Christ. So within time he effectively calls them, grants them faith and repentance, and having rescued them from the dominion of darkness, brings them into the kingdom of his Son, in order that they may declare the wonderful deeds of him. Notice why we're called? To declare the wonderful deeds of God. And by the way, Sinclair Ferguson is right when he says, you, you almost will never meet a true Arminian. Because a true Arminian would say, Lord God, when my son or daughter calls on you, save them. What do parents pray? Lord God, save them. You, you save them. I give my children to you. Every Arminian knows that only God can save. And that's why, you know, when you really stick to the, to the Bible, and, and, and that's one thing most Arminians do tend to really believe in the Bible, when you speak about that, if you ask them, how did you get saved? Well, Jesus died for me. They didn't say, because I made a choice. You might meet somebody like that, but very rarely would we, we say somebody would take that glory for themselves. It's because we know that it's absolutely true. So having rescued them from the, uh, the kingdom of darkness, he brings them into the kingdom of his son that we would declare the wonderful deeds of him. That's what evangelism is. Strictly speaking, all you need to do in evangelism is tell the glory of God. Tell him what God did in your life. By the way, I've just been reading some stuff this week, and, and um, it, it was good again. I, I know our own church here, we, we want to talk a lot about uh, programs, evangelism programs. And when a church becomes very institutional, and we, we are at Covenant, uh, fairly institutional, we have a long history, there's a way that we do things, we have a building, we have budgets and all that kind of stuff, we also tend to become somewhat business-oriented, and so if we had a good program, by the way, I'm not saying that, that these programs are, are without meaning, but programs are useless unless you all invite people to come to the program. But what's also interesting is because so much has been um, abused with programs by many churches. The most authentic evangelism is you. When they talk to you and they hear you and they see that you love them and they see the change in your life, you might be on the planet to save one person. Or you might be on the planet to talk to four reprobates. But if we can't talk about how great God is. And yet, you know, um, it's amazing. Martin Luther talks about that. Um, we're either too scared or uh, we think we're not competent enough or we just don't care. And it would be really, really too bad if we just don't 
care. Don't we want everybody to have what we have? God saved us when we couldn't do it to open our mouths. Psalm 51, Father, don't withdraw your spirit from me, creating me a clean heart, oh my God, and renew a right spirit in me, and I will teach others your way. Psalm 32, which we just did at Case Lindhout's funeral, is the exact same thing. When I kept guilty silence, my strength was spent with grief. But when I confessed my sins to you, you forgave me. And then he teaches others. And he sings about the greatness and the glory of God and even sings for God. And I will teach you, don't be stubborn like a mule. Don't be stubborn like a horse. It's really a remarkable, beautiful thing when we come to understand this. So when Arminius teaches God graciously left in every man an ability to choose for righteousness or sin freely, and God does not actively interfere with man's freedom, it just isn't supported by Scripture, is it? And, and the other thing is, too, um, it really changes the way preaching happens. Because preaching either is here is Christ, here is, here is crucified, this is what this text says. So Elijah's out in the wilderness, and he's feeling very desperate, and, and you know what, he's tasted the things that Jesus Christ will taste of when he goes to Gethsemane. The difference is Elijah cops out, and Elijah, or Jesus says, no, I'll do it. It's really amazing, right? Um, or I have to persuade you. And if I have to persuade you, then I would tell you that I, at least, and I would say most men that I meet in the ministry are complete and utter failure, right? And, and by the way, if all I need to do is persuade you, I can start couching on some things. If, if the only thing that matters is getting you in the church and to get you baptized, I'll do what it takes, right? But if we can say, my work is to simply bring the word of God as best as I can and let the Lord bless it, and your work in your jobs as parents here in the church in your neighborhoods just be faithful just plant the seed but every farmer knows you can plant the seed probably a lot of you are getting ready to do your gardens you can plant all the seed you want but if God doesn't grow it it doesn't matter it just changes everything there's a comfort in it it's not my fault that someone doesn't believe I, I need to confess something if I led people the wrong way and I need to confess some, some, something and I've had to in my life when my behavior didn't match up to the office but at the end of the day your children's salvation is not because of you nor is their lack of salvation because of you you are called to do your work before almighty God to declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light that we would never boast in ourselves but in the Lord as apostolic words frequently testify in scripture and don't we see that here Mankind given to himself will fall into sin. Now you can understand the world you live in. But for the grace of God, you and I would be doing the exact same thing. Think of a sin that you struggle with, that you really struggle with, and if you didn't have the Holy Spirit in your life restraining that sin, what would you be like? Or if you're like me, there's 20 of them. What would you be like if it wasn't restrained by the Holy Spirit? He protects you. It's, it's really a remarkable thing. So when you, when you begin to see that, and, and, and then he comes and he calls in your life by what we call irresistible grace. And that means when the Holy Spirit knocks on your door, he is going to open that door, and he's going to walk into your life, and he is going to grab you, and he's going to call you. Sometimes we say he's like that arm that, that comes, and he swings that hammer of the word of the Lord, and he busts your stony heart, and he gives you a new one. Ezekiel, right? Chapter 36. I will, I will replace their hearts with a flesh and blood heart, meaning a soft and compliant, a beating heart. That's the power of the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord on its own is powerless without the Holy Spirit. Do you see again why Pentecost coming up on Sunday is so important? I can preach till the cows come home. I could even be faithfully preaching to the text. But what does Paul say to Timothy? You preach that word in season and out of season. And it feels sometimes, beloved, that we're preaching out of season. This church used to be packed from what I'm told. you know, And, and now we don't have that. But that isn't necessarily because you're not living a good life or that the preaching, there's something wrong with it or that there's something wrong with the music. It could be just simply that there's not that many elect here. 
But if we're here, there must be elect still that we're out to reach. Otherwise, God would move us or we would disappear. So again, right? You are not going to be judged. Covenant Reformed Church is not going to be judged. Praise God, I'm not going to be judged by, well, Al, how many did you, did you convert? I can tell you right now, zero. Right? I mean, I think I've made this joke before, but if I had to be paid on commission, I would be dirt poor. Right? Because what, what could I say? I've got, you know, well, we're going to give you, uh, you know, 10 grand for every head you bring in. I didn't bring any in. Right? So if, if we begin to understand that, the power of the Holy Spirit, um, 3, 4, 12, under the fourth head of doctrine, irresistible grace. And this is the regeneration, the new creation, the raising from the dead, the making alive so clearly proclaimed in Scripture by which God works in us without our help. Which of you helped when you got born? Which of you helped when you got conceived? Then how is it possible when God uses the word born again that you made yourself born again? It's, it's not possible. And, and, and logically, we know it's not possible. But spiritually, we absolutely know it's not possible. Which God works in us without our help. So if I make a choice for God, and I have to make a choice for God, I understand that the reason I made the choice for God is because God made a choice for me and made me able, made me capable. This certainly does not happen by outward teaching, moral persuasion. So in, in, um, in the United States, there was a thing called the uh, Great Awakening. And uh, they would call that kind of preaching, and especially in the second great awakening, what they would do is we would put you on the hot plate. Do you want to go to hell? Look at the way that you're living. You were bound for the fires of hell. You don't want to go to hell, do you? And we would scare you out of hell. I got to give my life to Jesus. Well, within a generation, the church was a mess. Because the reason we would want to believe is, is to be at one with Jesus Christ. If, if our only, only hope is to escape hell, what does that even mean? But when we understand that, that the gospel comes in, Christ crucified, and you he's made alive again, and by the power of the Spirit you can live a new life. So it's not by moral persuasion or by such a way working um, that it does not, uh, right? But after God has done his work, it remains in man's power whether or not to be reborn or converted. Rather, it is entirely supernatural work. One that is at the same time most powerful, most pleasing, a marvelous raising the dead, or sorry, a marvelous hidden and inexpressible work which is not lesser than or inferior in power to that of creation or of raising the dead as scripture inspired by the author of this work teaches. As a result, all those in whose heart God works in this marvelous way are certainly, unfailingly, effectively reborn and do actually believe. And then the will, now renewed, is not only activated and motivated by God, but in being activated by God is also itself active. For this reason, man himself, by that grace which he has received, is also rightly said to repent and believe. You know, you'll meet some people sometimes that always drag kicking and screaming into heaven. That's actually not true. Once you're saved, you want to go to heaven. Once you're saved, you want, you, you, you might have been drag kicking and screaming up to that point. But at a certain point, God will change you and you know there's that uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman song when when love takes you and everything changes and it does the way you see life the way you see Christ the way you see your husband wife your friends church all of it everything changes but for the grace of God go we when God sends a spirit to call a person to conversion the spirit cannot be resisted why because it's unconditional election when God decided to choose you do you really think you say no I don't want to be saved of course not because that would make you more powerful than God. Arminius taught the Spirit does all he can to call a sinner to repentance. Can you imagine? God, God says, Mark, I, I love you. I, I love you. I, I sent my son to die for you. And you go, yeah, that's interesting, God. And that God would go, oh, man, that's another one I missed out on. Or is it that because you were sitting maybe with 50 other people that day and he said, Mark, you're mine. I love you. And then the power of the Holy Spirit says, yeah, he does. And then you're sitting there, why do the other 49 not believe? It's not because something in us, right? It's because God changes us. And, and, and he gets all the glory. Because that's really what, what it is, a sola deo gloria. Who gets the glory? God gets all the glory. The Spirit does all he can to call a sinner to repentance, but he can be resisted. The Spirit cannot regenerate a man. 
Think of that language. And again, look at, look at Genesis 11. It's just all over it. Nobody can do it of themselves. Really, would anybody who heard about the flood and knew that they came from a, a world where, like there's got to be corpses and all that kind of stuff all over the place still. And the ark is still there and, and Noah is still there and Shem is telling the, the, the children. Right? I mean, to this day, cultures still have a story about the flood. And you know all about the flood and you would still say, meh, I think we can build a tower and a cigarette and escape God. How could that, how could that many people be that unintelligent? Because that has nothing to do with intelligence. It has to do with hardened hearts. We are unable to make a choice for God. We don't have freedom to do that. He has freedom to save whom he will, and he does by giving us the power of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, God will keep working. He'll work through Terah, and then he'll work through Abraham. Abraham, get up, go from your country. Finally, then, the fifth-headed doctrine, perseverance, or some people like better the preservation of the saints, but it is, strictly speaking, the perseverance of the saints. Because of these remnants of sin dwelling in them, and also because of the temptations of the world and Satan, uh, those who have been converted could not remain standing in this grace if left to their own resources. So, you know, when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. What do we also pray? Lead us not into temptation. How come? The catechism puts it nicely, because I can't for one second withstand the devil. I know it because I didn't today. If, if God would let me go, even for a couple of seconds, depravity will hit. I, 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 you know. By the way, total depravity does not mean that human beings are as absolutely wicked as they could be. The power of the Holy Spirit still restrains that. If people were as wicked as they would be, then in Genesis chapter 11, all of those people would have killed the line of Shem. But God restrains it. Total depravity simply means I cannot make that choice for all mighty God. But once we make that choice, what happens? Noah hung in there for 120 years with everybody laughing at him building that ark because God was with him, with him and God preserved him and God made sure he was preserved so that the line could be preserved so that you and I could be saved. And then John chapter 10, no one can snatch you from my hand, says Jesus, because the Father and I are one and nobody can snatch you from his hand. The devil can't take what belongs to God. He can lead us. He can tempt us. We can fall short. David with Bathsheba, Peter denying Jesus three times. But David got saved. Adam and Eve got saved. And you are being saved. That's the precious power of the word of the Lord. That's why these doctrines are so important. And by the way, once you know them, we're informed of them as we pull them out of Genesis 11, but they also help us as we read Genesis 11 and see them there and go, oh, of course, if that's the truth of all of the word of God, then it has to be the truth in Genesis 11 as well. Because of these remnants of sin dwelling in them, and also because of the temptations of the world and Satan, those who have been converted could not remain standing in this grace if left to their own resources. But God is faithful, mercifully strengthening them in the grace once conferred on them by powerfully preserving them to the end. And then the Kenneth Dort will talk about going to church, your devotions, reading the word of God, praying, the communion of the saints, the, the sacraments. And I think for some of us, and, and I think that even in the church, that's why this has been a very difficult time, right? To not get to church. Some of that discipline leaves, right? You know, um, catechism classes, all that kind of stuff, and we, we've got to get them going again pretty soon because that discipline goes, and we miss it. And it's easy to just kind of, yeah, get flat about your faith or, or get despondent about it because we're not in it together and we're, we're missing each other. But just even coming together and singing in the sacraments, Right? I mean, next Sunday we would have had the Lord's Supper because it's Pentecost, and now, now we don't. And, and, and we don't just miss it because we miss it. We miss it because of what it means for us. Arminius said a genuinely saved man can lose his faith. And uh, by losing his faith, fall from grace and lose his salvation. You know, in a catechism class I'll talk about that, which is an interesting thing in Toronto. When you drive and somebody cuts you off and you say something bad and then you roll the car and you died and you didn't ask for forgiveness of your sin, would you be going to hell? No. Because God has saved you. Did you sin? Absolutely. It's not the way we would hope to leave the world, is it? But 
all of your sin has been put on Christ on the cross and all of it is taken away. I will remember all of your sin no more. Nothing can separate us, not even your sin. So it should be clear to us then that though the five points of Calvin are not expressly written in Genesis 11, that you're not going to read those doctrines, as we begin to read it, we see the sovereignty of God in preserving the line, right? Not one of the line of Abraham was lost before the time came. And even when it looked like it was all over with Abel, Abel was the first martyr, but Abel was the first one who got to go to heaven. God preserved him right to the end. Abel never lost his faith even when, when he, he's being beat up, beaten up and killed. And then God says there's Seth. Noah never faltered. And, uh, Japheth and Ham, they, they, they never faltered, right? Or Shem. They never faltered. Ham did. Why? Because God was with the elect. And God preserved that elect. So that ultimately, you go to Matthew chapter uh, 1 and you go to Luke chapter 1 or Matthew 2. And, and what do you read about? The genealogy of Christ, don't you? And that's that whole preservation of all those saints. Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, by faith, by faith. And though they were, the prophets were, were uh, sawed in two and sent to the fire and sent into prisons, they're saved. Because faith is an eternal gift from God. So it should be clear to us that we see an example of these doctrines at work even so long ago before Christ. The canons then, when understood, also help us see God's glory in everything. And any preaching that would bring the glory to man misses the point. Because remember, we've been saved to express, and that includes the preacher, the wonderful, amazing deeds of Almighty God. So that is our first uh, session, um, first 10 classes. Uh, I'll keep you posted. We'll see what's going to go on with the restrictions and, and the summer. Summer vacation is going to start. You know, more of you are going to want to be outside, so perhaps we'll look to the fall. By the grace of God, I hope we can be face-to-face -face here in the church basement. That's much better, and then we can have a little more interaction. Um, if there's any feedback in terms of the presentations or, or ways we can make this better, please let me know. And uh, that's our evening tonight. So, Jason, any questions? Yeah, two questions. Um, first of all, how are we to understand 1 John 2 where it says that Christ is the propitiation for our sins and not only ours but for the sins of the whole world? Good. That, that's a good question because in, in, oh, I guess I should read that. In 1 John 1 um, verse 2 it says Christ is, is the propitiation for all of our sins and not only ours but for all the world. Um, John is picking up what he wrote in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, all right? So world means different things in scripture in terms of context. So world can mean the creation, God so loved the creation that he gave his only son, that he's going to save the creation, that whoever believes in them, though they die, yet shall they live again, John 3, 16. And in this case, the world means those who are all over the world. Right, and we, we read that from the canons of Dort. Every tribe, every language, all right? So all doesn't mean always, and we, we know that too. When I, when I speak of all the family, I don't mean head for head each person, but as the group, that is the church of Jesus Christ in the world, not only you, church, who are reading this, but all Christians all over the world. Christ, and propitiation means that Christ took on that sin, made it his property, so to speak, and then took it, and, and, and in his death, took it from uh, the sight of Almighty God. All right? So it doesn't mean it made it possible, nor does it mean that everybody's forgiven, because, again, if, if everybody's forgiven, then everybody should be going to heaven. And, of course, as we keep going in John, First John, um, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar. And it, and it talks about the absolute need of faith. And, and to live out of a life of love in that. So I'll leave it at, at that, Jason, and, and if they respond back, let me know. Is there another question? Um, this doctrine is hugely comforting to most Christians, but is it just as comforting to those Christians who have relatives that are, have seemingly walked away from God? Yeah, so um, the, the doctrine of election... Um, the doctrine of, um, you know, the sovereignty of God. It, it, it is of great comfort to us, um, but it can be. I found this especially when I, I've had people who have come to the Lord 
and they know it, but they really wrestle with the fact that, like for instance, Sonia and I know a couple where three of their children died before they were baptized and they came to the Lord. What, what about those children? What do you say? Or what about people who really love the Lord and their children walk away? Obviously, that, that is, I think that's harder than being diagnosed with cancer. I, I think an excommunication of a child or a, someone you love doesn't believe, that's worse than death. Um, because it breaks our hearts. And, and of course, sometimes we don't see that. But the, the, the plus of the, of the doctrine of unconditional election is we don't know who's elect. We don't know the will of God. So we keep petitioning him. Heavenly Father, your will work in the hearts and lives of that. But it also means, and I've seen that as well, because sometimes parents can be really hard on themselves. And, you know, they don't see the children that believe. They only see the children that don't believe, and then they think it's their fault. And I think, you know, pastors and elders, we can really think that as well. Um, but we can't give faith. We can only be faithful. And when we're unfaithful, we ask for forgiveness. And in, um, again, Sonia and I know a, a lady who buried her husband who was an unbeliever and her two children who are, who are unbelievers. And, and I, I did the funerals especially for the two children. How do you stay so strong? And she said, because this is the will of the Lord, and I have to accept it. If I don't, I will lose it. And, and she lives in that strength, and it's, it's a remarkable thing. I heard one of our own members this past week talk about a struggle in life and saying, Father, I love you. This is who you are. Help me to, to accept it. But um, the devil has a nice way of using this doctrine to throw the blame back on God. And if my child doesn't believe, or the people I love don't believe, that's on them, not on God, or necessarily on us. So, again, I, I hope that helps. Um, and the, the problem when you're dealing with doctrine is it can be a little bit cold, right? But I, I do hope that people find some comfort in that as well. That, that it wasn't up to you to save somebody. It was only up to you to declare the marvelous acts of God. Anything else? And no... Nothing coming back. Okay. Jason, thank you for giving up all of your evenings, and especially because it's super busy um, for you. Uh, it's been a joy. I'm going to miss talking with you afterwards. Thank you for all of you who so diligently came out. I really appreciate it. Thank you for you who have been watching, and I, I pray that uh, we can continue in this marvelous book as we pick up the next section with Abraham, the Lord willing, um, and who knows, maybe Jesus will come again before that. That would be even way better. So let me pray with you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are the God who chooses, you create, and you recreate. Your kingdom come, Lord. Rule us by your word and spirit. Empower us through the power of the holy word through your holy spirit. Call us, Father, and mold us and make us after your will. Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May all the elect in your way and in your time come, and Lord, may we be part of that process as we declare the mighty and the beautiful acts of God. Father, give us each day our daily bread. Watch over us. Give us the means of physical and mental strength that we need to do the work of evangelism in our own day-to-day -day work, that we may bloom for you and we may be lights in this world. And please forgive us our debts. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. And move in our hearts that we would be a forgiving people as well. We ask, Father in heaven, that you would lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For as we've confessed tonight with Adam and Eve and with Abel, with Noah, with Seth, and with Shem and Abram, there's no way we would ever survive the onslaught of the devil, the demons, and the world. Rescue us from this world, Father in heaven. And if we get into those positions, even sometimes by our own making, give us the way out that we may run to you and flee evil and find joy and hope in the good. And Father, we pray all of these things because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. To you be all glory, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.